This session is uh, also about intent and declarative programming. The previous session we talked about X forms. This one we'll talk in the same kind of area. If you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand. And there's a microphone going around, so we can actually hear your question on the recording as well. Thank you. Hi, my name's uh, Dave Schmoody, and today we'll talk a little bit about uh, art and programming. Um, dive into it real quick about me. Um, so I got my undergrad in computer science, went on to do some music, uh, got my master's in music. Uh, then I worked in time-based media, uh, some programmatic uh, computational art, also some traditional Narrative uh, storytelling, uh, I worked in that for 10 years, and now I work at a company called Next Journal in Berlin on computational notebooks. So, uh, to start off with, um, I want to kind of bring both worlds together and make sure that uh, uh, some of the parallels are set up from the outset. So, artists and programmers do share a particular concern, specifically around um, the, the, the issues uh, related to representation and um, abstraction, meaning that artists are trying to, take, um, trying to take perhaps a canvas or a sculpture, raw material, and they're trying to turn it into something to represent something. Right? And of course, uh, programmers know that this is also uh, something that uh, they do in code. Now, uh, Conversely, there's another concern that works opposite of that, and that is around abstraction. And of course, uh, abstraction has to do with some like higher level concepts. And in your case, in Coder's case, it's around, uh, for example, taking like parts and not writing the same thing twice. That's one example of using abstraction in programming. Right? Now, um, I'm assuming that there are some people in this room that are familiar with uh, what's happening in the art world today, and there's probably a lot of you that aren't. So I do want to get us all on the same page because I'm going to be talking about contemporary art and not so much about art in the past, and what we can learn from contemporary artists as programmers. And so um, some of you probably have had this feeling before, um, this idea of like you go to an art museum, it's like, I don't, I don't get it, right? And this is a very common thing. Or another one is uh, you look at the painting, oh, my kid could do that. What is that about? Right? And so um, this is a, this is a, a, a concern uh, amongst uh, lay people. They feel like they're kind of outside of the joke. So I want to make sure that we're all on, on the same joke before I continue. So um, we'll define a few things, have a very quick art history lesson, and then move into the code. So first of all, uh, uh, defining the art object. Right. The art object is, um, most of the time, in our traditional ways of consuming art, is on a human scale, meaning it's made not on the scale of galaxies or the subatomic scale. It's made on a scale that we consume, maybe we have in our houses or we have in buildings. Okay. And this is what I'm talking about when I say you, you approach an art object and you say, oh, what does that mean? Or why is that here? You expect to find something in that object to relate to you because it's on a scale that's talking to you. Uh, maybe even if it's a tool, maybe you ask what that object does. Now, conversely, those objects sit uh, in an environment, and oftentimes we don't look at the environment and say, oh, what does it do? What does it mean? The environment that's around us, we usually just tacitly accept. Sometimes we ask, uh, can we manipulate it? Uh, just before I started this talk, there is, uh, I guess, some conversation about the air conditioning in here, right? Can it be manipulated? Can it be warmer, right? Not what does it mean to be cold, right? And these are kind of the setup. And if these, if this, this is kind of the setup with how we consume. And if these terms also sound familiar to programmers, objects and environments, um, that's an intentional parallel that I'm going to draw. So to get to this point, though, um, I want to lead to, get to this point of contemporary art, I want to lead in and talk about a very narrow part of art called Western art. 
very small part of the pie, and I want to talk about it post-Renaissance to lead us into today. Um, this is maybe some art that looks kind of familiar, um, this style of painting. Um, so this obviously is a representational, representational piece. Uh, it was done around 1660. And of course, the key here is that this, uh, this object is being represented very clearly, right? Um, and it takes a lot of skill to craft something like this. Uh, the accuracy of the rendering is important. And also, don't deny uh, accepting the fact that the drama of this piece is also important. The lighting is not arbitrary. Some of it's technologically based. They didn't have overhead lighting or so much overhead lighting at the time. It's probably candlelit. But even in contemporary uh, uh, paintings featuring figures, uh, it's also quite dramatic. Uh, fast forward a number of centuries to late uh, 19th century art, and we get this Impressionist uh, piece by Manet. And of course, notice that the rendering accuracy is not as accurate, right? It's not because Manet didn't know how to paint accurately. Right? Manet is going after something different by this time. Okay? Also notice that the, the subject matter is very commonplace in this. Um, this bowl of fruits, this drama and how this is all laid out. Right? These very high-end um, high artifacts are very different than a, than a pot of flowers. Now, this is still kind of maybe a, maybe a wealthier person's place. There's some pearls down there. There's a fan. But this is not so much about the narrative, although that's part of it. This is also about the texture of the flowers and how the light hits. All this metaphysical stuff. It's not about the depiction of ac the accurate depiction. It's about how colors feel, right? As much as it is about um, that they are flowers and they are rendered well. Uh, continuing into 20th century art, here's Piet Mondrian. And notice that the, we get an increasing level of abstraction here. Uh, careful not to like think of this as like progress. Okay, there isn't like progress in art like we think about technological process. This is just another phase. And Amandrian here is starting to become more concerned about the medium of paint itself. As we get away from representation, we start asking about painting, about the medium of paint, and how it is to express ourselves in paint, and not just render the thing accurately. Then some of these artifacts of accurate representation fall away. Uh, and we're also trying to get to an artist's maybe metaphysical state or something greater. Finally, uh, I'll sort of end the history lesson here uh, with this piece by Joe Baer. And uh, this is where we get really puzzled, right? We get to the art museum and we see three blank canvases and what is this about? And what's happening here in contemporary art is this art object, these three canvases. Um, Joe Baer isn't so concerned about um, the comfortable thing of something that's knowable, because the object, remember, the object is knowable. It's something that we can touch, and it's on a human scale. It's not about the art object. Artists by this time, by the mid-20th century, are talking or thinking more about how people are engaging art, okay? the act of engagement, that temporal state in an environment, a time and space, and all of these larger things. And so she's acknowledging that the canvas is just a canvas and it's nothing more, and there's nothing to represent because it's reflecting a larger reality. Okay, now this might sound like a bunch of uh, artists sort of BS, but the, but the reality is, is she's acknowledging an entire uh, artistic canon up to her point. She's acknowledging an entire past. Okay? She's acknowledging a larger culture of museum space. What is museum space? Why is museum space only ac accessible by certain people, of certain classes, of certain parts of the world? Okay, so she's taking all these larger environmental things into account. Now, this is also happening in computer science at the same time, where the ambitions in computer science in the mid-20th century become increasingly great, where we're going to not just, by the mid-20th century, we're not just going to try to model things like um, uh, atomic chain reactions or, or movement of artillery shells. We're going to try to model something like communication. So this is, uh, this, these illustrations are taken out of Licklider's and Taylor's um, uh, landmark paper, Commuter, Computer as a Communication Device. And what they're saying here with this, uh, with this illustration is, you know, this is the problem we're going to solve with computers. This is going to be great. We have two people talking. We have two people talking, and one's talking about a woman, and one's talking about uh, uh, a bike. 
and as they're describing it, they're essentially modeling what's in their head and they're transferring it to the other person. Right? Uh, and then when there's noise in the system, uh, this gets all munged, uh, the term at the time, I suppose, munged, and they don't, they, they're not communicating clearly. They have the exact wrong idea of what's happening in the other person's head. But think about how ambitious this is. We've gone from trying to model some artillery shells going through the air in a computer, and we're trying to model thoughts in people's minds. This is a very ambitious idea. And part of the problem with this is it includes things like all the presumptions I have, all the unconscious biases that I have, that I don't even know, right? All the factual failings, all the intuitive intelligence that got me to this brilliant point, right? And it points to this hubris that Licklider perhaps had when he thought that we can get all this in the computer and we can send it over the wire if we just model the real world accurately enough, right? And so we have a slide like this, uh, also from the paper. A communication system should, be, should make a positive contribution. Okay? So here's this guy, he's trying to draw a little heart for his sweetheart or something, presumably. The guy can't draw. So what's going to happen is the computer's going to help us out. Right? It's going to know the intent of the person, what's in the person's mind, and model it based on software, and then transfer it over the wire. Computer's communication device. Now, this sort of hubris is seen throughout all the 1960s in computer science, right? There's a time when we're just going to, natural language processing is going to be a solved problem, right, in the 60s. Artificial intelligence is going to be a solved problem. It's just around the corner. This ambitious idea that we can just model it all. This is also seen, of course, in another uh, part of computer science, another area of computer science, in object-oriented programming. Now, this is not going to be a talk about how OOP is bad. Okay. But this is going to be a talk about what went into the thinking when people were starting to think about um, what goes into the idea of OOP at the time when people were starting to come around to this idea as a solution to complex problems. And so here I have a really simple object. And in this simple object, I have a post uh, that I'm going to make. And this post has these attributes, these qualities. The maximum size of my post that I can make is uh, 200. 80 characters, and we're going to presume that this post has some text. Right? And this is the model of a post that I start out from the outset. Right? And the thing, about this, um, the thing about this idea, when I first start thinking about a post, when I sit down, um, I'm making all these assumptions about the world. Right? And the model and the code are directly tied. They're the same thing here. And so if I want to change the model, I have to change the code, of course. And so I, I test my object out. I'm going to call this kind of post a tweet. I just kind of made it up out of thin air. I'm going to send it. It sends just fine. Uh, I'm going to try one that's greater than 280 characters. And the API says, oh, you can't send this. It's too long. This is a great way to program. The only problem is, of course, is if I need to change the model, then I have to change the code. And OK, so maybe I need, a, maybe I need to have a, a different word count, because I want to like, create a platform, I don't know, called WordPress. I still want to post, right? So, OK, I change maybe the model, or I use some inheritance, or I, there's all these solutions in OOP to solve this. But it becomes even more difficult if I don't even want, even if my uh, initial basis is wrong, my, my instantiation there is wrong, and I don't even want text. But if I just want to post SoundCloud, now I've completely, this is going to be a really hard problem to inherit around, to work around with objects. I'm, I really do need to change this object. This is really a new thing. My suggestion is, of course, that maybe these things shouldn't be tied. My suggestion is that, for example, they can be separate. They can be, you can have, for example, specifications where the model is not the code, where the model validates the code. Right? And so here I have a, I have a couple pure functions, uh, one called send post, and one with my API call. Nothing per particularly interesting here. Um, this is my spec. And my specification says this should be less than 280 characters. And of course, uh, I send uh, some data to my function. The API call works. I send some data to my function that's too long. It passes. It does not pass the validation. And if I want to change this, for example, if I have a different environment, maybe one called WordPress, I don't have to change the function. The function can move to an entirely new environment. This environment is called WordPress. And this environment called WordPress has different uh, specifications that are valid. 
right? I'm not changing any of the functions or anything like that, not doing anything different about the code, because the, the functions aren't making any presumptions about the environment. The functions know nothing about the environment. They don't care. That's not part of the specification. That's all the specs work. And now I run the exact same function in, of course, uh, this environment, and it works just fine, right? And the interesting thing here is, of course, when I move this function, of course, we wouldn't copy paste functions like this, hopefully. But if I move this function between environments, then it reveals to me about the environment itself. And so let's say I have a very simple object, like a ball. And all my experience with ball is uh, with rolling, with throwing, with, uh, with uh, squeezing. All of this is in an environment that I know. I'm going to call it Earth. Okay? And I model this ball so incredibly accurately, all within this context. And all of a sudden, someone says, hey, we can go to the moon. Okay, well, now my object is, like, with all these presumptions, you can see how many presumptions I might make in about ball with this environmental context. I can't easily move it, right? So this is the problem with modeling within environments that we think we know. And one of the ways around this is to not think about objects and not think necessarily how these objects are going to happen and how they're going to be how methods on objects are going to, going to uh, turn out in an imperative uh, context, an imperative execution context, but uh, rather thinking about uh, things declaratively and starting from a declarative uh, standpoint. Starting from a standpoint, a declarative standpoint, where you say, I have no idea how this is going to work, but I'm going to explore the problem. I'm not going to try to model it all right away. And as I figure things out about the environment, I'm going, to actually, um, I'm going to actually create specification as I go along. This is especially uh, useful in more complex systems where you're first, you're, you're, it's your first day on the job, it's your first day on the job, and you have all, these, all of this code that you've never touched before, and you have to go exploring. You, just, you really have no other choice. And if you have objects that are inherited from other objects and you have to pull in all of this uh, knowledge just to execute some code, and you have to understand all this context, this is going to be a very hard job to start off with. So this is, uh, coming back to artists, this is something that we can learn from these artists. So uh, this is a quote by Jackson Pollock, for example. I want to express my feelings rather than to illustrate them. And so what he's saying, we're, gonna, we're, we're still in contemporary art world, what he's saying is rather than trying to paint a picture that illustrates, like I feel, I feel fierce, I'm going to paint a wolf. Right? Rather than trying to get the object correct on the canvas, the canvas itself is the emotion. And so Jack, uh, Jackson Pollock uh, was uh, pejoratively called okay, Jack the Dripper because he was famous for his drip paintings. And the thing about Jackson's, Jack and Pollock's work is, and we'll, we'll look at it in a second, is that this is a person that, that didn't exactly know how he was going to execute this statement express feelings rather than illustrate them. But what he's going to do is he's going to intuitively follow some ideas and principles and try and apply okay, and explore. And it's not always going to be logical and sequential. It can't be imperative. But the neat thing is that the results, the output, can be analyzed in this process. You can see what is working and what is not even if you don't work logically and sequentially, you work intuitively in an environment to understand it. In this case, the environment and what we're trying to understand is the interstate of Jackson Pollock, and he's trying to express them. Right? So when they did some analysis on Jackson Pollock's paintings, okay, this, is what they, this is what they look like um, uh, in the late 90s, they found something pretty interesting about his paintings. Um, this technique has been used to authenticate uh, Pollock's work, to authenticate new Jackson Pollocks that are discovered. And what this is, is this is a range of, 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 of how fractal an image is. And the one on the left is non-fractal, of course. The one on the right, of course, is non-fractal. And then the ones in the middle are all Jackson Pollock paintings. Right? And actually, they tend to go actually chronologically. As Pollock refined his technique, as he refined his technique, he got more and more fractal in nature. And his later pieces that are considered masterworks are the most fractal pieces. Now, this is not his intention. This is not what he set out to do, right? In terms of like, well, I'm going to make fractal paintings. I'm going to execute step A, step B, step C, step D, step E, 
and then i'm going to end up with this result there is no way he could have done that because he didn't know enough about the environment the environment is his inner state so this particular one is this d one point six uh... fractalness this is kind of where he ended up for most of his uh... dripping career um, and um, these pieces uh, you know, uh, were pretty controversial at the time, and still my kid could do that. Well, as it turns out, uh, through some analysis, uh, fractal analysis, ten children's uh, fractal paintings tend not, or sorry, children's drip paintings tend not to be fractal. Pollux do. And Pollux actually end up looking much more natural. So, for example, Richard Taylor, the, the person that started a lot of this analysis in the 90s, he put together this cute little montage called Spot the Pollock. All these are natural things in the, in the world. And this is one of the reasons we like fractals, because they're, uh, they're all around us in the natural world. And one of these is a Pollock. And the other things are just things that are naturally occurring, like tree branches, uh, sticks on the ground, stuff like that. And my assertion here, I mean, my declaration is, of course, declarative statements make it easier to explore, right? Um, specifically, declarative statements uh, that are that are not dependent on other declarative statements, where you can explore a simple, one simple declarative statement. And it's very hard to work imperatively early on or to model complexity really early on, because you just don't know enough about the environment. So going back to our computer's communication device, <clears throat> this is how it, of course, ended up. And I want to talk a little bit about this uh, environment and why it ended up uh, on this platform and how it ended up here. This is Tim Berners-Lee's desktop, uh, I don't know, 1980, 1991, 1992, something like that, on a Next uh, computer, uh, Steve Jobs' second company after Apple. Um, and uh, a lot of software was started on Next. Uh, and Next computers were not actually, of course, that prevalent. I mean, it was still a world with a lot of PCs, some Macs, some Solaris stations. Right. But um, I don't know, the next computers, I don't have an empirical study on this, but they have sort of an outsized influence in terms of the amount of software that was developed on this platform at the time versus other platforms. These, these engineers claim to be quite productive, and there's, there's a number of landmark uh, pieces of software like the World Wide Web that was originally developed on Next. And why is, what is happening here? What is going on? Well, Steve Jobs tells this like anecdote, especially he was telling this when he was trying to pump the company's stock value up. Uh, he tells this anecdote dozens of times. And it goes like this. He said, you know, when I first went into Xerox Park, before he, before he worked on the Macintosh, when I first went into Xerox Park, I saw three things. And I was so blinded by the first thing, I missed the other two things. And the first thing was the graphical user interface. The people at Xerox Park were creating the graphical user interface. He said, this is amazing. And he based the Macintosh around that. And then when he left Apple, or was <laughs> dismissed, or however it went exactly, when, the, when he started Next, that's when he focused on the other two things that we're doing at Xerox Park. He focused on network computing and object-oriented programming. And um, Next ended up, of course, eventually being bought by Apple when he got reabsorbed. But the foundation of Next Computers was Next Step, the operating system, and, the, and, the, and Open Step, the API, that allowed you access to these objects. And this, is, this, is, this was actually very powerful. Object-oriented programming was very powerful. And it probably did make developers more productive. Um, these, this is the, the graph of objects that uh, are available to you. Uh, in Next Step in 1989, and you see some familiar things, of course. You see sliders and buttons and, and whatnot. And this idea of visual programming never quite made it where you can like drag stuff onto a panel and arrange buttons and sliders and just kind of build an interface out of objects. Didn't ever quite materialize like that, but um, it still had a lot of reusable code, a lot of reusable components that you didn't have to remake from scratch. But the problem with a graph like this, even though it looks a lot like data and it's very hierarchical, it's, it's not data, and it doesn't show us the important stuff. It doesn't show us the state of any of these objects. You can't see any of the state. You can't zoom out and see state here. Um, and you can't, the more important thing probably is you can't see how they message. It has, I mean, it has, says nothing about messaging. And um, in, when you put objects together, it's very hard to see how they, they communicate. 
which is became, became one of the problems with object-oriented programming, ultimately, I would argue. Now, Apple, who bought Next, and who's, who, who uh, if you were an Apple developer, you probably worked in Objective-C uh, at some point uh, in the last 20 years. Right? Apple finally uh, started to get started to move away from Objective-C as well. This is off their website. I got it off their website yesterday. Uh, for this new language, of course, they released, what, four years ago now, Swift? This new part of Swift now, Swift UI. And just listen to the copy here. Swift UI uses a declarative syntax, so you can simply state what your user interface should do. Okay, so before, the objects are going to make user interfaces simple. And now, we've gone all the way back around where we're going to work declaratively, and that's what's going to make user interfaces simple. Um, for example, you can write with a list of items consisting of text fields and then uh, describe alignment, font, and color for each field. So it's all data. And if you look at this, it looks, some of this is uh, pretty lispy. And um, we, have, uh, we have a state atom there of some flavor that holds the state. And of course, we're just going to change the, um, the data that's inside of it, and we're going to have some kind of reactive response. And so what, we're ha what we have here, instead of objects that are kind of assembling together that, we, that, that, are, that don't have all this transparency, what we have here is we have a bunch of data that's going to help us describe the environment. And to work with this, uh, I decided to um, uh, work with an environment that I actually don't know very well. So I work at NextJournal, but I actually am the developer advocate there. I don't actually do a lot of coding. So I took this talk as a way to, hopefully this works, to um, learn a little bit more about how the application actually works that my peers developed, right? And so what we have here is, for example, the state of the application, of the front-end application, uh, the app DB. Okay? And this app DB is uh, what it looks like. It's just a bunch of data. So it's completely transparent. And I can um, run a cell on this data, run a function on this data, and see how many cells there are. There's 123 cells, OK? Or I shouldn't say cells. I should say nodes. Um, and what I'm going to be able to do then, uh, what I'll be able to do then is actually, for example, update the app while running the app itself as it's all live. And for example, um, here's my, sorry, here's my database. Here's the count of how many nodes there are. I can dispatch uh, uh, some data to it. Not an object, but some data. The data is a keyword, insert new, insert code node, and an ID number that I just got from the Web Developer Council, uh, because that's all data as well. And I execute the cell, and it inserts a code node above it. I check the state again, and of course, I have one more node in my database. I go one more time, I update it once more, and now I have 125 nodes that are uh, available for this article. Right? So, um, the way I got there was I was just doing a little, exp um, I knew where the DB was, and I was doing a little bit of exploration on the reframe dis dispatch. Of course, reframe isn't something that we wrote. Uh, this is a library that we're using. Uh, but I thought this was also a good uh, opportunity to explain it, uh, to explore a little bit of reframe. And so I mounted our GitHub repository here, and I just did a grep for insert code node. Uh, on our source code, and here it is. Here is a registered uh, effect for insert code node, and all it is is a pure function. It's a pure function that's going to take data and return data, which is going to make this pretty easy to explore, relatively speaking. So this pure function uh, right here, I put it in a code cell, and I take a look at uh, the result of this code cell, and I see it's a, it's a map with my database and a dispatch function. And already, I'm starting to map these things together in my head. I'm starting to understand how, how messages flow through the system of this, of this notebook interface that I don't, sorry, of this notebook application that I don't fully know. But because things are pure, and I don't have to inherit a bunch of stuff, and I don't have to understand uh, the jungle if I just want the banana, OK? I just want to understand the banana, not the entire jungle. Well, this is helping me grasp what's going on. And so, for example, I can take that earlier other pure function that I wrote called send posts, and I can use it in a next journal environment. 
by, uh, I could have composed things together because they're pure functions, but just for clarity and for time's sake, I just uh, instead just uh, dropped the reframe call in my dispatch. And um, I didn't really have to remove anything from the function. I just kept adding new features to the function. Uh, so it won't break any previous uh, incantations of the function. And I run it. And of course, then I can get, when I run this one, I can get, of course, uh, not just the send post to the imaginary send post to Twitter or the imaginary send post to, uh, to WordPress. Now I'm sending the post directly to the next journal, right? And I've changed almost nothing about send post. I've just added some things I've learned about next journal. And I've changed nothing about the call, really, right? And uh, this was actually a very simple process for me to explore because I didn't have to know, I don't have to know a lot about how Next Journal is built in order to do this. So, uh, to kind of wrap it up here and to finish it on some of this art stuff, um, of course, uh, this term refer referential transparency is about, of course, being able to use a pure function and being able to use a pure function and take out. Uh, take out the call and just put data there and it still works, right? So we're just, we're really just dealing with data and we can always see the data, right? And that's one of the most important things about working this way, that availability of seeing the data and that data is uh, represented of just this moment in time. Um, I'll, I'll wrap it up with, uh, by paralleling this work with the way, uh, paralleling this idea with the way that Donald Judd thought about his work. So this, uh, this particular quote is also from the artist I just mentioned, is from the artist I just mentioned, Donald Judd. Actual space is intrinsically more powerful and specific than a flat surface. And out of this kind of thinking, this declarative thinking, you get something like this. <laughs> and again, like, what is this? <laughs> you know? This is just a bunch of squares in a field. Right? And this, this is the sort of art that is quite challenging to a lot of people that are outside of the art world. And um, <clears throat> Instead of thinking of this as, I mean, you can think about it as a bunch of squares in the field, and you probably should. <laughs> but look at the nuance of what's also happening here. What Donald Jed was really interested in was reducing the art object, increasingly reducing the art object, and, and, and making art objects that said more about the environment they sat in, they reflected more about the environment they sat in, than about the objects themselves. So he's very concerned about the materials. He's very concerned about, for example, um, the, the engineering of the right angles. He's a very precise artist, a very systematic artist. And here, um, in this particular case, this is a field in Marfa, Texas. He was so concerned about environment that he essentially uh, bought a military base, in, an abandoned military base in Marfa, Texas, and he used all the bunkers and all the space to set up art objects within uh, so that he could control all aspects of the environment. He, he was done with museums. Museums, he doesn't have enough control over. And there's all these things that happen in museums uh, that he just, he has no say in uh, with how light works or whatever. Okay? And he wanted that control of the environment because that's how the pieces, that's how the objects actually have meaning. Right? And if you look at these squares in the field, uh, boy, there's a lot we can tell about this environment, right? Um, we can tell a lot about how time has passed, right? How not weathered they are. Um, we can tell a lot about what time of day it is, right? Um, these shadows are very sharp, they're very pure, right? And this is as much about the shadow and the thing around it as it is about these squares themselves. These are like little pieces of data in a field, right? And when we move data to different environments, it might say different things. So I'll wrap it up with sort of some declarative statements about data. We'll see how, how well these age. <laughs> but. Um, these, the, the taking in the context of art, um, these, these statements, um, hopefully will resonate a little bit more. So, uh, Donald Judd was against, was not so interested in uh, the art object and was so interested in the environment because, for example, the art object like a painting is, uh, is a depiction of an object that points to an environment. And it's not the environment itself. And in fact, the uh, thing depicted in the painting is actually not specific enough to encapsulate what it's actually depicting. 
nor is it detailed enough to embody the environment around it. so in his mind, like for example, an art object like a painting kind of failed both ways but something pure a pure object like this that didn't have so much artifice and that was reflecting the environment ah had much more to say fundamentally and my declarative statements about data is kind of reflects that that fact the fact that for example this object isn't trying to be everything it isn't trying to be meaningful it's trying to reflect the environment data itself isn't trying to be complete it's not data is never a finished product software isn't a finished product either but in a way objects from their outset you're trying to get the model correct but data is always always going there's always going to be uh, more data down the line there's always going to be different shapes of data and how you select the data that's the human touch that is the small details that um, that is that act of curation as a programmer the small details the things that you leave out the data that you leave out the details that you leave out of an art object those that's what makes you a, a more gifted programmer and it's also the hardest decision it's a much harder and nuanced decision than an impossible decision uh, which is how to model the world that you don't really understand in an object and specifically then around this data when you when you and how you invoke a function that takes this data that's the thing that reveals the complexity of the environment itself so you have all these really small decisions what data to leave out when to invoke a function that make up all of this complexity that comes out of it but I don't know about you but that's about the scale of decision that I can accurately make perhaps but if I'm actually trying to model something that in an object in a world that I don't fully understand I'm just that's the first thing I do when I sit down is like how am I going to make this encapsulate everything it needs to encapsulate this is going to be a very difficult and big decision and so my declarative statement is make small decisions make small decisions and try to make them intuitively and as accurately as possible and analyze the results thank you We have some time for questions. So the data is informed by the environment. And do you have any insight into how to feel out the environment? When, when, if you have the da data, but you don't know what the environment is or what, what, how it is useful in that environment. Do you have a, a strategies for feeling out that environment? And how, because that also informs the shape of the data that you want to collect and store and not leave out, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, one of the things I left out, like one of the most important things that also is a, like a legacy of OOP, um, is of course polymorphism, right? And so, um, first of all, like, if it's an environment that you don't understand and a lot of people worked on it, yeah, putting data into systems and seeing what comes back, not just, I mean, this is where, this is where specifications can be really useful because they can, they can create better error messages, right? More informative error messages than just uh, like compiler time errors, right? About the specific data you're sending it. So first of all, it is about uh, putting data into the system. Uh, if there's some if there is some uh, polymorphic execution flow that says a lot already about like depending on what data you put in when you call a function you get something out right so you learn a lot about the context there but then on top of it um, but on top of it it does depend quite a bit on how well uh, how well architected the environment is and if and if it is indeed um, something that is not very well thought out um, you probably won't get a lot of great response back, to be honest, right? And um, then you start to realize kind of what you're up against, right? And honestly, like, where to spend your time? Because, of course, you don't want to... If you, if you get in a position like that, you don't want to uh, try to refactor the... You know, you probably don't have time. You can't re-implement re the entire system as it is. And so maybe... Maybe there is time well spent abstracting off that system, for example, and creating 
something for the next person right that as they explore they get something valuable back they get some valuable feedback right okay um, no more questions we still have some few minutes yep. question in. Um, you mentioned your background in music and I was quite curious to hear whether your ideas apply to that as well because you focused a lot on visual art but I guess even just ideas about sampling or music as being a representation of data seem to be kind of a compelling application for what you talked about. I don't know if I can answer that. Uh, <laughs> um, it's it's um, Obviously, you can draw you can draw parallels. Music, music itself, uh, of course, has more uh, strict. Uh, <laughs> it has uh, when you start out with something like, uh, for example, uh, functional harmony. Functional harmony is essentially when you hear when you hear something like Beethoven. It's based in the system that was developed in Western Europe. And it survived for centuries and instills the foundation of a lot of pop popular music. But jazz harmony is a little different than that kind of harmony. So that's, but this is a system, right? The, my point is, is that jazz harmony is a system, that's why it sounds like jazz. Uh, functional harmony is a system, that's why it sounds like uh, Beethoven, for example. And these systems um, are also systems that were challenged in the 20th century uh, as well. Um, and created a lot of challenging music that uh, that audiences do struggle with. And um, I guess the problem I have with the parallel is that um, there is a lot of like when an audience comes to an object, they 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 have so much they they work so hard to get something out of it. They just, they want it to have answers. They want it to have meaning. They want it to have, there's all this expectation, right? And with music, uh, the expectations are very different because they're, um, because, for example, uh, it's already quite abstract. Music is abstract, and so, like, it's hard to tell a story with a beginning, middle, and end in music. I mean, you can, but it's very hard to get the details in there and, like, how this character feels and how, without words. And so, um, people usually kind of expect music just to emote, right? And whereas art objects is a different, I, I feel like there's a slightly different set of expectations from the audience that come to it. So that's one of the reasons I focused on 20, 20th century art objects and not 20th century music. Thank you. Okay, so, so this concludes our um, morning session. We now have lunch, so take out your little lunch tags. Um, we'll reconvene at 1.30. Thank you, David. Yeah.